Okay. Good morning, and welcome to Aschalas Hazman for LL 5780, Tavshin Pei, a Zman like no other. This continues to be the longest time for us not being together in person on campus, to greet each other, to learn with each other, to hug each other, and to inspire each other. We Baruch Hashem were able to transition to Zoom Zman after Purim, but how can we begin a Zman on Zoom? That is an even greater challenge, but I'm certain that it's a challenge that our Talmudim are ready to pass. Let me explain to you why I'm confident in each and every one of you. Perhaps by examining the daily avoda on the Beis HaMikdash, we can find a healthy approach to our daily avoda and tending to our daily activities that are Baruch Hashem very filled with spiritual aspirations of avoda Hashem. What is the first avoda on the Beis HaMikdash? What's the first thing that happens each day? You might think that the first avoda is the Korban Tamid. Of course, the Korban Tamid is the first thing that they do and the last thing that they do. But is there another avoda that takes place? The answer is, is that before the Korban Tamid, the Kohen first must perform another avoda. And yes, it's called an avoda, the avoda of Trumas Hadeshen. What is Trumas Hadeshen all about? The Kohen goes to the base of Mikdash. He goes to the mikvah. He does Kiddush Adayim Reglaim, just like any other avoda. Then he ascends to the top of the Mizbeach and he moves aside the ashes that have been burning from the night before from the previous Karbanos. But why do we begin the avoda and the base of Mikdash each morning with something which one might call removing the ashes as taking out the garbage from the previous night's Karbanos? Why begin the day with removing the Truma Sadashin. Explains of Samson Raphael Hirsch, the meaning behind the daily myths of Truma Sadashin is a reminder for us for our daily avoda in two important ways. And this is the theme I'd like to discuss today. The first is that anytime we begin our day, our day and how the Kohen began his day in the Beis HaMikdash, we must first reflect upon what came before us both in terms of the previous generations, the zechus avos that we all have, and our own spiritual gains in order to propel us forward. We need to reflect backwards. What came the day before? But secondly, and just as important, every new day is a fresh beginning. We clean the slate to open up for new opportunities and to new ways to expand our avodas Hashem, new horizons, Things that maybe we did not try in the past, we can start today, Hayom. Further, we should never pat ourselves on the back and say, oh, look how much I accomplished yesterday. I don't have to do any more. There's no more striving. I've already reached the mountain. By clearing the Mizbeach every day, the Kohen is representing to us that we start new afresh and we cannot only look upon what we did in the past, only in a way to propel us forward, not in a sense of accomplishment. Both of these messages are critical for the Haskalas Hazaman in general and specifically this year. First, we must acknowledge what we've accomplished. Transitioning onto Zoom after Purim was not simple, and the Chevra pulled together. Rebbeim have told me time and time again that more fellows in Talmudim were on the Zoom sometimes than in person in Shir. And we owe a great debt of gratitude and credit to the Rebbeim who they themselves had to learn new methods of technology in order to connect to the Talmudim. Ashrenu, and thank you to all, and Akar Setov, to all the Rebbein that have invested so much in each of the Talmudim and continuing to learning with them and growing with them from after the, when we went online and continuing throughout the summer. But to you too, as well, our Talmudim, you showed us what dedication to Torah means. To quote our own Jacob Bach, which you'll be seeing soon in one of the videos that we'll be showing today. The Chevra continued night seder. They were on the bima clop every night, every single Zoom. These guys are strong. These guys are great. But now we also need to look fresh at the new Zaman. We can't just look at the past. We need to look forward. And for those that didn't fare as well as you may have hoped to over the, over the Zaman, over the summer, and maybe things have slipped a little bit, now is the time that haschala, that freshness, 
the beginning of a new day, to dig a little bit deeper, to make another stronger ed- dedication to your oneself, to de- make that commitment to the Sadarim, to the Chavrusas, to the areas of Avodah Hashem you wanted to grow in. Now we're in Elo, now's the time to recommit. And for those that were able to keep up, move that forward, move, use that momentum to reach even higher, to take upon even more. I'd like to also be, uh, give a big thank you to in front of the yeshiva to Rabbi Bacon and to Rabbi Schnall for spending so much time this summer putting today's event together and so many learning opportunities that we have planned over this Elozman. They've coordinated so many dozens and dozens of programs. Please make sure to check out the WhatsApps and the emails to be in touch and to understand all the events that are coming your way. Incredible lineup of speakers. I also want to thank the many Talmidim who in a short few days were able to put together some satellite Bate Midrash in different areas of New York and New Jersey, and it continues to grow. And all the many Rebbeim have, have committed to schlepping out to some of these areas to learn with the Talmidim, to see them, to be with them, to talk with them. Such is the dedication of our Rebbeim, such is the dedication of the Talmidim for Talmud Torah. We definitely feel the thirst and desire for Torah, the cheshek for Torah that permeates our yeshiva. Today, we have a multimedia presentation, including three videos. The first is what we call looking back, reflecting on the end of last month and hearing perspectives from, from your fellow Talmudim. The last video, the third video, is looking forward, getting us excited about the news man and the many opportunities for growth and connection. In between these videos, we have a tribute of a glimpse to the legacy of our past president and Rosh HaYeshiva, Rabbi Dr. Norman Lamb. I say a glimpse because there's no way to summarize Rabbi Lamb's remarkable imprints he left upon our yeshiva in just a few minutes. And we are all indebted to him and beneficiaries of his toiling on behalf of our yeshiva for so many decades. However, I would like to reflect upon one word to describe a unique Torah education that Rabbi Lamb presented to us, as you will see in a few moments. And that is ambition. Rabbi Lamb paints an ambitious picture how each of us in our community can and should strive for. And this as well is my message to you today, my dear Talmidim. As we begin this newsman together, remember the messages of the Truma Sadeshin. Build upon the past and march forward. Be ambitious with your goals that you set for yourself. And with this, I wish you much haslacha this man and offer my bracha that you're able to accomplish all that you set out to do this man as we prepare together for the Yamim Noroim. Out to me last semester was the seamless continuity of Shir. Whether it was Pesach break, June's month, Shir continued without a pause, and that's what I'm looking forward to this semester. One special thing about Yeshiva after the pandemic was just the constant communication that was there between us and the Rabbim and really the whole Shir, and that was something I really appreciated, especially going through those difficult times. The resilience and the passion of the Chevra and the Rebbeim to continue that feeling of Torah and being in Shir while on Zoom during coronavirus was really amazing and I'm very grateful for it. Something I found to be a blessing through all the chaos last semester when everything turned to Zoom uh, was a unique opportunity to connect with different people no matter the time or distance. Uh, it seemed as though Torah learning was unbounded and that no matter the time or place, there was always a chance to grow in your learning. Um, I know for me that I was able to learn with my Rav, Rav Goldich, um, even though he was in Israel and I was in America, and even though the time difference, we were able to take advantage of the Zoom um, and be able to grow together and learn. Um, these are unique opportunities that we have, and these are opportunities that we have to capitalize on. One of the 
of the highlights of last semester was the Yeshiva Wide Seum. The Yeshiva sent food to everyone's home, arranged incredible speakers, and gave us all a lot of chizik as well as a real sense of achdos. One beautiful memory that's always going to be with me from this past very unusual semester is I live in New Jersey, my Chavrusa lives in Canada, and we're both so concerned how we can be able to continue that same fire, that same passion that we always had being in the very loud YB and Midra surrounded by everybody. And I'm never going to forget that very first moment when his voice just blasted through my headphones. We both knew at the exact same time that we're, we still have the same fire, the same passion, the same excitement that we always have in the YB and Midra. And Baruch Hashem, we had an unbelievable, beautiful semester of learning. We were sitting at my desk in my room and, and seeing it night after night how so many of the YU Chaver were signing on for the Bima Club, for the Rabbi Shreyer Musser. Every single night when no one's watching, and I remember these guys are strong. This is a strong Chaver, and I can't wait to start the news on with this amazing Chaver. We've all been, unfortunately, to many, many funerals, even if it's been just uh, over Zoom, during the past six months. It has been an especially difficult time. But one thing about Zoom funerals that's really so unfortunate is that people who pass during this time of the pandemic, they disappear. It's been something I'm dealing with many families with the sense that a loved one who perhaps they hadn't seen for weeks because the person was in the hospital just disappeared and they weren't given the closure that they deserve. And the person wasn't given the person wasn't given the honor that they truly deserve. It's made even worse when the individual wasn't in public even before the pandemic when the person, because of one reason or another, because of disease, because of other uh, degenerative diseases, has been out of the spotlight. We lost Rabbi Dr. Norman Lamb and his wife, Mindy, during this pandemic. And Rabbi Lamb's memory, as the memory of his wife, can't just disappear. Rabbi Lamb was a multifaceted leader, scholar, philosopher, and visionary. You know him perhaps as someone whose name appears on a sefer or whose picture appears on the wall. It's Chaval. Rabbi Lamb was a brilliant man. And what Rabbi Lamb did for Yeshiva University literally allows us to be here today, to have the Smicha students in the Beis Medrash, to have the Zoom conference together with everyone else from our yeshiva. We begin a new zman, a period of learning in our yeshiva, on campus and long distance over Zoom. You don't understand, none of this would be here if it wasn't for Rabbi Lamb. A number of years ago, they were cleaning out his office. He had the foresight to allow his farm to be taken before he passed. And I came upon a small box that had in a few tapes. In it was an audio cassette of Rabbi Lamb's inauguration at Yeshiva. He left a thriving kahila in the Jewish Center in Manhattan to take the all, to take the weight of running Yeshiva University. And through his efforts, through his transformative efforts to make YU into a Makam Torah, he laid the foundations for everything that we have today. He was adamant about the primacy of Torah and Torah learning and adamant about its primacy in our institution. He went to great lengths and made major investments to nurture our Talmidim and to ensure that our yeshiva had the most high caliber Rabbeim in the world. And now, almost two decades since he stepped down as Nasi of the yeshiva, our Bate Medrash continued to bear the fruit of his efforts. And we carry the torch of his Torah vision for our yeshiva forward into a new generation. Look at the cut, look at the video we're about to see. We are not merely a college with the added convenience of a few Judaic courses and Jewish dormitory ambience. 
this is not Torah Amada. Chas v'sholem that Torah should be that Torah should be and that is why and I regret that I must add one more caveat never never should anyone misconstrue any version of Torah Umada as a dispensation for zilzul b'mitzvahs the idea that Torah Amada means less observance or less piety or less concern with mitzvahs is false, it's outrageous, it's even blasphemous. Only a return to genuine religion will ensure our continuity, and by religion I mean nothing but Judaism, and by Judaism I mean Torah, and by Torah I mean that halacha is accepted not as a guide, but as authority. Wisdom is worth sharing with you, our U.S. Mesnachim. If you are to be leaders, if your goal is the honorable one of Ayifku Bamalachai Lakim, I tell you, don't be overly concerned with what others say or press you to say. Don't pander to the left and don't cower before the right. In Torah, there is neither left nor right. If your way is Al Torah Asha Yorucha, then what follows is Lo Sasur Mimashi Agidalacha Yaminasmo. There is only one way straight ahead. And only with such firmness of method, wedded to sacredness of purpose and going with what you believe honestly is Derech MS, will the world know Kiyesh Navi be Israel. We modern Orthodox Jews want to hold our heads high. We've got to have a Torah educated laity and it's not gonna happen on one half hour a week. The study of Torah is obligatory for every individual and for every community and without it, no one has the right to that honorific title Orthodox. A very, very old man, bent over, appeared in the Brisky Yeshiva, sat down at the Bismedish, after he took out a Gemara, and began to learn by himself. Whereupon, the David Soloveitchik, the son of the Velvet Soloveitchik, came over to him and greeted him. The old man said, This is the Heaven the Yeshiva? This is the Yeshiva of Heaven? And the said, Nay, this is the Brisky Yeshiva, the Yeshiva of Brisk. The man, old man, looked up in disbelief, opened his eyes, and he said, The Chaim Lepbach? Is the Chaim still alive? It transpired that the old man had studied in Brisk when the Chaim was still alive and left in 1913, caught up in the Russian Communist Revolution. He was then exiled to a remote area of Georgia, completely cut off from contact with Jews. He had a few Gemaras that he managed to take along, and he learned for 75 years. Didn't see not only... Five years didn't see not only another Litvak, he didn't see another Jew. So nobody learned by himself. And now, with the great Ruula that came to Soviet Jewry, he came to Yerushalayim, and we heard that it was the Brisky Yeshiva. He said, Rav Chaim Lepnach. And indeed, Rav Chaim Lepnach. And we'll always talk as long as we'll be Talmud Torah. And we are here to say, we the Talmudim of the grandson of Rav Chaim. That the Byasha Ben Salavatik Lepna, he still lives and always will live in our midst. Yes, yeah, he's a Chrob Baruch. You get just a little bit of a taste for what a powerful speaker and a powerful force Rabbi Lam was, Yehezich Ro Baruch. It would be an appropriate time this year for us to pick up articles that he wrote, pick up Divrei Torah that he wrote, read the books that he wrote, to make sure that Rabbi Lam's memory lives amongst us as well. Rabosai, let me share with you one thought that to me encapsulates the challenge that we all face that we faced for six months, and we face as we come to the time of the newsman. I believe that I mentioned this at Shalashudas, 
either last year or two years ago. Well, we all know that something that happened last year or two years ago seems like it was 15 years ago. Anyone who um, follows Yishai Rebo and uh, listens and remembers his song, Elul Tufshin Ayin Tet. Tufshin Ayin Tet, wow, that song feels like it was written a decade ago. Tufshin Ayin Tet was just a year ago. So let me share with you something from the depths of my heart, something that I try to remind myself every single day when I wake up, especially when I wake up in a day that I know that I won't be leaving my home. It's one of the most famous stories in the Chumash, and therefore it's chosen to be laned on Rosh Hashanah. It's early in the morning and a single parent leaves home with their son. They carry provisions. They'll be walking for days and it's not exactly clear where they're going. Only the parent understands where this journey is gonna end, leaving the comfort of their home. The child strangely asks very few questions, at least in the text, as they follow their parent to an unknown future. And the worst fears are realized. Maybe when they started out, they hoped that this would end differently, but it looks like the child is going to die and never come home. The parent seems to have made peace with the terrible outcome. Their precious child, a child of old age, a child that no one could have imagined was going to die. And then in a flash, everything changes. An angel steps forward and speaks and at very last second, the child is saved and not just saved, but told that he will be the father of a great people. That's the story of Hagar and Yishmael. And I know many of you are wondering, that's not the story we were thinking of. That's the story of the Akedah. That's the story of Avram and Yitzchak. Have you ever wondered how remarkably similar the stories are? Avram too leaves his home for a journey. Yitzchak seems oblivious to his fate. Avram seems resigned to God's will. And there's a near-death experience, the knife in the air, and then a malach comes forward and ends it. But consider the following. Hagar too leaves the home of Sarah with her precious child. She too knows why they leave the comforts of the home while the son is undoubtedly confused. They wander into the wilderness for days until it becomes clear that Yishmael, the son, is in grave danger. The parent may have led the way from home, but now the child takes center stage. Hagar, like Yishmael, like Avraham, is resigned to her child's fate. She hides herself as to not witness the death of her child, and then suddenly a malach comes out, and they're saved and given a miraculous bracha. How many times have you sat in shul for the two days of Rosh Hashanah and never realized that the two stories are exactly the same? The story of Hagar and Yishmael that we read on the first day of Rosh Hashanah and the story of Avram and Yitzchak that we read on the second day of Rosh Hashanah are exactly the same. A parent and a child, a journey into the wilderness, a near-death experience, a last-minute heavenly reprieve a parent whose eyes have been opened and a divine blessing of fantastic proportions. So why don't we think of the story of Yishmael and Hagar the way we think of Avram and Yitzchak? It's not just because one is the foundation of sacrifice and one is our, our ancestors to something else. Listen closely, Rabbosai. Avraham while he doesn't know what will happen with his precious Yitzchak, he knows and he feels that God is watching. Avraham knows that he is in the spotlight. He was suddenly asked to leave everything that he had done to go into the wilderness, but he understands that HaKadosh Baruch Hu was going with him. He may have wondered what HaKadosh Baruch Hu was planning. He didn't understand how this made sense. This was the opposite of everything that he had been doing. The miracle child, the future. What are you thinking, Ribona Shalolam? Why would you stop this all? But he knew that HaKadosh Baruch Hu was watching and that he was in God's camera. Hagar too was on a divine mission and the Torah is recording every single step she takes. 
And though she was commanded to leave by Avraham and not God himself, she too becomes the lead actress in a divinely orchestrated play. The tragedy of Hagar's story is that until the last minute, she doesn't know. She thinks that the director of this movie has the camera where? On the house of Avram and Sarah. She thinks that's where the action is taking place. She can't imagine that the Torah, that the Jewish people for generations would be looking at her. I'm not blaming Hagar. God spoke to Avram. He knew. God didn't speak to Hagar in that way. But it's tragic. Because Hagar was on a divine mission. She was living under the watchful eye of God. And she didn't know it. Rabosai, we too are on a divine mission. Not just one we were sent on 3,000 years ago, but each one of us on a personal mission. We're on a mission whether we know it or not, whether we like it or not. We are in God's spotlight all the time. Our feeble minds can't imagine that a Kaddish Baruch Hu could pay attention to every single one of us sitting in every single room that I see on this screen. We're told that a Kaddish Baruch Hu is our father. And yes, that is true, but it limits our understanding of him because a father does, Taka, have so only so much attention. He can't pay attention to 245, 246, 246 participants who are watching at the same time. But a Kaddish Baruch Hu can. We speak of God as Avinu Malkeinu, our father in heaven. Avinu Shavashamayim. But maybe it's better sometimes to remember that he's our mother in heaven as well. Rabbi Salavechik taught us that while a mother may physically leave the presence of her child, she has a latent awareness of her child that never disappears. We're always in our mother's spotlight, whether she's standing next to us or watching us from the Olam HaEmes, wherever she is. And like a mother doting over a child in a nursery play, whatever we're doing is the most important thing. Even if I'm that kid who's just one of the candles in the Hanukkah play in nursery, and I got that stupid flame on my head, she thinks I deserve an Academy Award. Do you know that when I was in seventh grade, I'm not bad at public speaking by this point, at seventh grade, I was cast as the wall in the Midsummer Night's Dream of Shakespeare, the wall. I stood there like this under a brown sheet. That was my part. And you know what? My mother thought I was the star of the play. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is not just Avinu Sheva Shemayim. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is Imenu Sheva Shemayim. We are always in his spotlight. If you are watching this from your room and you're wondering, I should be in the yeshiva. I should be somewhere else. I should have started a job. I should have done something else. Realize HaKadosh Baruch Hu is looking at you. I know there's a feature on Zoom that pins one of us. Now it's me. And it says, I am the spotlight video. Every single one of you is in the spotlight video of the Ribona Shalola. Every one of you is exactly where you're supposed to be right now. And you are the star in the video that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is making. I remember once talking to a boy from my shul who had come back from learning in Eretz Yisrael after struggling with mental illness. He was mamish and Eloy, this kid. And he was in a very top yeshiva in Eretz Yisrael. And he was told that he was going to be a Rosh Yeshiva. And, he was going to... and suddenly he found himself in my office. And he's crying. This is not where I'm supposed to be. He was not a child of ego, but Taka, he could have been. Eh? He said, I'm supposed to be in yeshiva now. I'm supposed to be growing to be a Rosh Yeshiva. And I said to him, what if your tafket in life is not to teach a shir in a high yeshiva, but to show people that you could struggle with your mental illness and you can get up and you can get the Seder on time? If you don't think HaKadosh Baruch Hu is watching you, 
as you struggle to get out of bed in the morning, you're the star. You're the star of HaKadosh Baruch Hu's world. Every single one of you. It's a lesson, Rabosai, for those of you who know my family that I had to learn myself. Many of you know my son, Matis, who's now 24, a superstar who struggles with autism. You know what it is to be the rabbi of a shul, which I was for many years, and have a son with autism? It meant that many times when the davening was going on inside the main shul, I was somewhere around the building with Matis. And that was okay. That was my schus to be able to have a special child like Matis. But I can't tell you how many times I daven Shmona Esrei in a different room. I was told, I understood from my days in Hask that a counselor is responsible to take out a child even in the middle of Shmona Esrei. I remember sitting and talking to Rav Shechta before I went to Hask to discuss all of these Shilas. In the middle of Shmona Esrei, you're supposed to walk out of the room if he's disturbing others. So what if you're the rabbi of the shul and your son is disturbing others? You walk out in the middle of Shmona Esrei and you finish Shmona Esrei somewhere else. You know, it's like, not just to be a Balbus, to be the rabbi of the shul and davening in a side classroom with your son while everybody else is in the shul. And then I eventually came to understand. HaKadosh Baruch Hu's spotlight was also on me. I wasn't any closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu when I was in the shul with everybody else. Wherever I was, standing there with my son, Matis, that's where HaKadosh Baruch Hu was. And that's where HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted me to be. Have any of you truly ever been in the spotlight? Any of you acted, any of you did a play in Camp X, the camp that you won't admit that you went to at one point, but the camp, you ever been on a stage? I'll tell you one thing. You can't see anything when the spotlight is on you. You can't see a darn thing when the spotlight is in your face. Everything is black in front of you. You have no idea what's going on. But it's at times like that that you have to remember that you're in the spotlight. Rabosai, we don't know what's going on. We don't know why HaKadosh Baruch Hu has chosen to put the world into this place and to put our learning into this place and to put our yeshiva in this place. And I dare say that were this done chas v'shalom by anti-Semites, were it done by enemies of the Jewish people, I dare say that you would feel charged, that you would feel revved up. They're trying to stop us from learning Torah. We're not going to stop learning Torah. They don't want us to be in the yeshiva. Was the yeshiva closed down by anti-Semites, by an anti-Semitic government? You'd be learning at home fearful, but you'd, every moment would be, wow, this is, this is my tafkid to be learning Torah at this difficult time, even from home. But we don't look at the face of a Nazi. We look at the face of darkness. We don't know why this is happening. We don't know why we're being asked to be home. We're home because we're safe. We're home because that's how we're wading into the water slowly at the yeshiva. I know there are other yeshivas that are opening. It's not that they're machmir in Torah and that we're not. It's that we're machmir in pikuach nefesh, very machmir in terms of keeping everyone safe. We're home because HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants us to be home right now, and we don't understand, and we can't see a gun to our heads. All we see is darkness, and I know that it's so hard for so many of you as it is for me. I know that many of you are struggling with depression, as are so many young people. You want to be back to the old life, but HaKadosh Baruch Hu has put us here. Let me tell you one thing. I also don't know why we're here but I know that each of us is in the spotlight. I know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu cares about whether I get up in the morning. He doesn't just care about whether Kalal Yisrael gets up in the morning and Kalal Yisrael keeps learning. He cares about whether I get up in the morning and I keep learning. 
every one of you is the star, is the star of a movie that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is making about how his brave children continue to learn and to daven and to grow even at this incredibly difficult time. And it's a movie that's playing in Shemayim, Rabosai. It's a movie that'll play now and next year, and we're all 120. It'll play then too. Be the star. Push forward. It is a difficult time for all of us. I don't know what this year will bring. I don't know if we'll make it back after Yom Tov. I don't know what's going to be with the spread of the coronavirus. I'll tell you that. If there's one thing this past year taught us, it's that we haven't the foggiest idea what's coming. I hope that we'll be in Yerushalayim sooner than we think. I hope that this is all leading to waking up every human being to think to imagine that something that can't be seen is more powerful than anything else. I thought, I hope this has humbled mankind and made it ready for the Amos Mashiach. But we don't know. We don't know what's coming. But there's one thing we do know. That whatever happens this year, every one of us is in the spotlight. I wish you all, if I don't have a chance to do so, Ksiva v'chasima tova, you are precious in the eyes of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Every one of you is the only son of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And he cares not just what your chaveirim are doing, but he loves you and he cares about what you're doing because the spotlight is always on you. Much hatzlacha in the coming zman and the coming year. I'd be remiss before we finished just to thank, not to thank, as Rabbi Kalinsky mentioned, not just those who put together today's program, but your Rabbeim, for whom it is so hard to teach on Zoom, so hard to be able to follow up. They are not all healthy themselves. They are struggling with the same issues of dealing with the pandemic that you are. Their commitment to you is almost as inspiring as your commitment to them and your commitment to continue to learn. So thank you. There are many faces of the Rebbeim on this, on, this, on this call. Thank you to Rabbi Kalinsky, who couldn't thank himself, but has worked tirelessly. There was no summer vacation to be able to make sure that we could be learning. And Emir Tzashem, Emir Tzashem, he should let us be matzliach. He should let us understand what this is all for. And we should be zocha to see the Geula Shlema, the Mehera, the Amen. We're starting YU and I'm extremely excited about that. I'm excited to finally be with the Hever again and to finally be with the Rub. What I'm most excited about is having the luxury of having a sure setting of, our, of where everybody's dealing with the same sugya. So that when I'm stuck, I could maybe call someone up and cheer. Maybe call the Rub and really hock it out with them and speak it out with them. So, you know, I'm excited for that. I'm very excited to be able to be back in YU. I'm very excited specifically for being back in Sheer with Rav David Hirsch, who has been an unbelievable inspiration for me to push myself, to motivate myself, to uh, unleash all new potential. I'm very excited to be able to be back and to be able to ask Kashyas and learn more Torah. The thing that I'm most looking forward to for the news man is for sure to be able to learn the Chavrusa again, Mir Tzashem in the base of and get to hear the Kol Torah once again. One thing that I'm looking forward to in the coming month is just the day-to-day -day interactions with friends and Rebain. I'm really excited to get back to a uh, Kavua schedule of learning with my Rebbe Ramosh Tzvi every day and to be able to just have an opportunity to uh, have, have check-ins with Rebbe Israel and talk to him and hang out. So many things I'm excited for about why you're here. To name one, to see all my friends. Be it on the Zoom, in the base night, in the classrooms. I can't wait to see all my friends again. I'm in Rabbi Ismach's Sheer in BMP, and I'm most excited to see you guys in my Sheer, my Chabrusa, and most of all my Rabbi. 
Have a nice mark. I hope to see you soon.